Now that we have a general knowledge of what cryptocurrencies are, let's take a closer look at Bitcoin, which was the first cryptocurrency and still the biggest dog in the game. Crypto investors know that where Bitcoin goes, so does the rest of the crypto market. So it's a good idea to fully understand what Bitcoin is and is not. To really understand why Bitcoin was created and how important it will be for our humanity, we need to talk about what money is. Money has value because we all agree that it has the value. Before 1971, the US dollar and most world currencies were backed up by gold, which was held by the Federal Reserve. We all believe that the currency was valuable because it was backed up by gold, which everyone also agreed held value. After 1971, the US and the world went off the gold standard and money turned into what is called fiat money, which is not backed up by gold and is only valuable because governments mandate it to be so. So with the current financial system, we all agree that the dollar or other currencies have value because the government backs it up and says it's valuable. When you use your credit or debit card to pay for something at the store, your bank takes your money from your account and gives it to the store and then charges you a fee. This type of transaction is so ingrained in our society and the way that we think about money that it seems completely normal and okay for the most part. The reality is that the banks are really the only winners here. They make a profit from storing and transferring, controlling and issuing loans off of your money. And it's under the guise that it's safer there. And that may or may not be true, but also that you're not smart or qualified enough to manage your own wealth without their services. And this is how our modern financial system works, and we just go along with it. Our modern global financial system is vast and comprises trillions of dollars, but it's old and slow and built on old hierarchical principles that are not fair and equitable. Bitcoin was created to alleviate all of these shortcomings. As I mentioned in the previous module, a person or persons going by the pseudonym of Satoshi Nakamoto dropped a white paper onto the internet in 2009 saying that they created a new form of digital currency that would prevent another financial meltdown like the one in 2008, where the US government had to use taxpayer money to bail out the banks that were apparently too large to fail. Satoshi created Bitcoin and the Bitcoin network using a technology that was originally created in 1991 called the blockchain. Satoshi was the first one to apply a blockchain in what is now called Bitcoin. No one owns Bitcoin network and no single person, entity or authority controls it. It was an idea that was freely released to the world and created and built upon by multiple open source programmers and Bitcoin enthusiasts. Bitcoin was created as a way for the people to store and send value around the world anytime, anywhere at virtually no cost without using financial businesses or fiat currency. In our current financial system, bank accounts and credit cards are luxuries that most people around the world just don't qualify for, don't have access to, or simply can't afford. Even if you do have a bank account or a credit card, they can be frozen, restricted, and closed at any time without warning. And most banks are only open during the week from nine to five, and they're closed on weekends and holidays. Does the need to access our money only work on weekdays from nine to five? Obviously not. Bitcoin is both a store of value, like gold, and a means to transfer, store, and manage that value. This is because Bitcoin is both a digital value currency, and it's a network that can be store and transfer the bits of digital value. Value and usage of the value are simply one unified system in the case of Bitcoin. Bitcoin has value because we all agree it has value, and for no other reason. No government or central authority mandates us to value Bitcoin. Its value comes from what the market will bear. This will make more sense once I outline what components make Bitcoin valuable. Next, we're going to dive in a bit deeper so you thoroughly understand what makes Bitcoin so different from standard financial currencies and how it spawned the entire crypto system. To do so, we need to understand a bit more about the underlying technology of Bitcoin and all cryptocurrencies, which is the blockchain. The primary element that makes Bitcoin so unique as a digital currency and payment network 
is its underlying blockchain foundation. So let's talk about how blockchain makes Bitcoin possible using principles of the universe like math and science and without the need for accountants, bookkeepers, banks, or governments. The simplest way to understand the word blockchain is by separating the word block from the word chain. Imagine a list of transactions showing payments sent to and from people and getting listed one after the other as they occur. Once the maximum amount of transaction data in the list has been reached, the list of records becomes a block of data. This block of data is then added behind the previous block of transaction data and linked together in a chain. So the word blockchain simply represents groups of transactions data linked together. Now the three pillars of blockchain technology that make it unique are decentralization, transparency, and immutability. First, it's decentralized, which means that instead of data being stored in one place, like one computer in one office, data is stored in multiple computers all around the world. That also means that no one person, corporation, government, authority, or entity controls any aspect of the data recording and storage process. For example, we currently have a central banking system controlled by the government, a central authority that issues fiat currency that can reside in accounts controlled by banks or other similar centralized entities. Each of these entities is in complete control of where and how the data is recorded, stored, and managed. They can decide what type of servers to use, where the servers are located, and how their security protocols work. In contrast, blockchain allows transaction data management to be decentralized on a network of computers around the world using open source software. Any changes to the blockchain protocol have to go through a consensus process that no one person, company, or government has control to protect the integrity of the network. So instead of a centralized entity like the government deciding on how and where all the data is stored on certain servers in certain locations, a decentralized blockchain network is distributed on many devices all over the world. That is the essence of decentralization. Now the second pillar of blockchain is transparency. Transparency describes how transaction data is recorded on a public ledger that is available for anyone to see. This ledger of transactions is saved on a network of computers around the world, which makes it impossible for the data to be changed or altered. To better understand the value of transparency in data recording, storage, and management, let's compare these two scenarios. Currently, most citizens of the United States do not know how their tax dollars are spent. We just have to take the government's word for it and draw our own conclusions from media stories. And even if the government had to show us where every penny went, it would be very easy for them to forge or manipulate any data they choose to share with us, since they control all their own data and create their own reports. You can see how this scenario is not exactly transparent, nor trustworthy. So let's imagine a different scenario where all US citizens had access to a live running digital ledger that shows where and what every single dollar was spent. Basically, everyone could see a full disclosure of how our government is managing our money. The third pillar of blockchain technology is immutability, which means that the data recorded and stored on the blockchain cannot be changed, forged, or altered. This is achieved through math and computer science, and more specifically, cryptography and blockchain hashing. Bitcoin was the first use case of blockchain technology and every other cryptocurrency followed suit and is also built on blockchain technology. Now that we understand what blockchain is and how it works, let's connect the dots between Bitcoin and blockchain. In the Bitcoin network, each block of transactions has a programmed maximum amount of data it can store. So on average, every 10 minutes or so, a new block of Bitcoin transactions is created, validated, and published to the Bitcoin blockchain. So who are these people with Bitcoin software installed on their computers around the world validating transactions? And why would they want to do this? Well, Bitcoin transactions are verified and broadcast to the network via a process called mining. And this process is completed by miners. Miners are people or pools of people that use computers with Bitcoin software installed in them to maintain the Bitcoin blockchain. Maintaining the blockchain involves keeping the Bitcoin ledger clean, consistent, and permanent by grouping new transactions into blocks and publishing them on to the rest of the network for verification. For a new block to be accepted by the network, miners compete with each other using computing power to verify transactions in exchange for rewards. 
These rewards are in place to incentivize miners to participate in the mining process and ensure the Bitcoin network continues to be audited and maintained. The miners are rewarded with newly minted Bitcoins that were not previously circulating and transaction fees for the Bitcoins that were already circulating. The Bitcoin supply, a characteristic Satoshi Nakamoto programmed into Bitcoin, will only ever have a maximum supply of 21 million Bitcoin. Satoshi implemented a maximum supply of Bitcoin so it would mirror an inflation rate similar to gold. And thinking back to the mining process we discussed previously, you will start to see many similarities between Bitcoin and gold, which were all by design. Bitcoin was created to be like digital gold of sorts. Currently, 18 million Bitcoin are in circulation of the 21 total million supply. New Bitcoins are minted into circulation during the mining process when new blocks are verified. Currently, the amount of new Bitcoin entering circulation is 6.25 Bitcoins per block, which takes approximately 10 minutes to verify. Another characteristic Satoshi programmed to Bitcoin is what's called halving events. Halving refers to the reduction of Bitcoin block rewards issued to the miners by half. Block rewards have every 210,000th block, which on average turns out to be approximately every four years. May of 2020 was the most recent halving, which decreased the block reward from 12.5 Bitcoins to the current rate of 6.25 Bitcoin. So at the time of this video, about 900 new Bitcoins enter into circulation every day until the next halving event, making the annual inflation rate 1.8%. The advantage of having a fixed supply is that Bitcoin inflation will eventually reach zero once the last Bitcoin has been mined. Currently, the last Bitcoin will be mined in the year 2140, which is about 120 years from now. A fixed supply and high demand create scarcity, which typically increases the value of assets like gold and can be expected to play out in the case of Bitcoins as well, based on its performance in the past having events. Another advantage of fixed supply is that you don't experience issues like what we've seen uh, with the US dollar. Bitcoin was programmed in such a way that new Bitcoins enter into circulation at a fixed rate that halves over time to curb inflation, and new Bitcoins are distributed to miners proportionately to the amount of work they produce. The US dollar, on the other hand, doesn't have a fixed supply, so at any time the government can print more fiat money. And who decides who gets the money anyway? And where does all the newly printed money go? Is it distributed equally to people who are producing the economy, like in the case of Bitcoin miners? Nope. The people or corporations next to the government usually get the new free money, typically in the form of low interest loans, which is not fair and a neutral way of adding US dollars into circulation. In the last few years, the US government has printed an unprecedented amount of fiat and resulted in hyperinflation, devaluation of the dollar, which has greatly reduced the purchasing power of the US dollar over time. In contrast, Bitcoin over time will increase in purchasing power and the available supply continues to decrease so long as the demand remains steady and most likely increases in these times of uncertainty. Do you always have to purchase a whole Bitcoin when investing in it? Just like a dollar can be divided into smaller units like quarters, dimes, nickels, and pennies, Bitcoin can also be divided into hundreds of millions of a Bitcoin, which are called Satoshis or Sats, by the way. One Satoshi is 100 millionth of a Bitcoin, or Bitcoin to the eighth decimal place, which is represented as a decimal followed by seven zeros and then a one. Smaller units of Bitcoin and standard denominations make using Bitcoin as a day-to-day -day currency much easier, as it would be too limited to try to pay for things with one whole unit of Bitcoin, which at the time of this video is worth about $30,000. That would be like trying to buy a bottle of water with a gold brick, which really wouldn't work too good. Satoshi Nakamoto knew that in order for the currency to work in a society as a medium of exchange, it must be easily broken down into smaller increments so it can easily represent a value equal to end any goods and services available in the economy for exchange. And Bitcoin is more than sufficiently divisible as it allows for quadrillions of individual units of Satoshis to be distributed to anyone around the world. To store, transfer Bitcoin, you just need to use wallets. Now, there are several types of wallets and some types are more secure than others. The two general categories of wallets are hot storage and cold storage. 
Hot storage or software wallets are wallets that are on devices connected to the internet, like a computer or a smartphone. And cold storage are wallets on devices that are not connected to the internet, like dedicated cryptocurrency hardware wallets. There's devices like Ledger, Trezor, or BC Vault. Cold storage hardware wallets are the safest type of wallet because they're just not connected to the internet where you risk getting hacked. So as far as wallets go, I highly recommended investing in a hardware wallet like the Ledger or Trezos for storing and transferring your cryptocurrencies as they are a safe form of cold storage. Make sure you only buy hardware wallets from the correct official manufacturer's website to avoid getting hacked. Never buy a used hardware wallet and always buy directly from the manufacturer. All crypto wallets generally consist of two things, private keys and public keys. Keys are also referred to as addresses. So what is a private key or address? A private key in regards to crypto wallets is a secret 256-bit alphanumeric number that is randomly generated using cryptographic math functions. The degree of randomness used when generating a private key is so random that it's been described that there are more possibilities for creating a unique private key than there are atoms that exist in the entire known universe. So you can see how the odds of creating a duplicate private key is nearly impossible. A private key is the most important thing to keep safe as a crypto holder because your private keys give you complete and full control over any crypto associated with it. Using a private key, anyone can make irreversible crypto transactions, meaning they can send crypto to any other person or place without you being able to undo the transaction. Now, from the private key, a public key is generated. So what's a public key? Public keys are similar to private keys because they also have alphanumeric numbers. However, they're derived directly from the corresponding private key using cryptographic math functions. And the function operates in such a way that it's impossible to reverse engineer a public key to figure out the corresponding private key. So a public key or address is used only to receive crypto from others. You cannot use the public key to send crypto, only receive. So you could post your public key on a public website so that anyone who comes across it can send you crypto. So to put it simply, private keys are for sending and spending crypto, and public keys are for receiving crypto. A good analogy is your traditional bank account. You can provide anyone with your bank routing number and account number to receive electronic transfers from them. However, just a routing number and account number, they cannot access your actual bank account to spend your money. So think of the combination of a bank routing number and a bank account number as your public key or address. Anyone can use it to send you money. Now let's think about your online banking account, your username and your password. Using online bank account login credentials, depending on how your bank operates, someone could access your account and transfer funds from it. So think of your online bank account, username and password combination as your private key. If someone logs in as you, they could initiate transfers of funds out of your account. Now that we have a thorough understanding of what Bitcoin is and how it works, what determines the price of Bitcoin or any cryptocurrency? The simplest answer is simply supply and demand. As demand for Bitcoin increases, the supply decreases, which causes the price of Bitcoin to increase. But why would anyone want to trade their valueless fiat for internet money? Well, a lot of people have lost faith in the government, the stock market, and financial systems at large. And since the printing of trillions of US dollars causes inflation, Satoshi revealed his idea for Bitcoin in 2008 in the midst of our last financial crisis and launched it in the following year of 2009. So Bitcoin was actually designed to be a hedge against our current financial system. Bitcoin was born during a crisis and was built to survive crisis. It's what is called hard or sound money. Another significant reason is that the Bitcoin network has never gone down or has never been hacked in its entire existence. It's a very robust network. People are flocking to Bitcoin and cryptocurrency during times of uncertainty, transforming their fiat into something they believe will retain its value over time and almost certainly increase substantially over time. As we discussed previously, programmed halving events decrease the supply of new Bitcoin entering circulation, and the price of Bitcoin increases when supply decreases and the demand increases. Historically, data of the price of Bitcoin following a previous halving event have shown price increases nearly tenfold. 
several months after the halving takes place. Now that you understand what Bitcoin is, how it operates, and what the underlying technology is, you are ready to dive into the rest of the wonderful world of crypto.